Hello, everyone. This is Things We Said Today, a Beatle podcast program where we talk about the Beatles, everything about the Beatles, together, solo, and everything in between. And I'm Darren DeVivo, one of the three hosts of Things We Said Today. I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City at 90.7 FM. And uh, we also broadcast 90.7 FM HD2 for the few of you that still tap into your HD radios. And uh, we stream at WFUV.org. And there's an app for that, the WFUV app. And uh, I've been at WFUV now for several hundred years, it feels like. <laughs> and um, it's uh, it's been my life. And, uh, and now I'm here with you on things we said today, along with... Uh, my good friends and esteemed colleagues, you know, Ken Michaels, he's been doing Beatles radio programs now for, he's closing in on 40 years of Beatles radio programs to make him feel older. It's not quite 40 years, but at one time he was on WDHA in northern New Jersey. Uh, he spent a little time at XM Radio. At the moment, he's the host of Every Little Thing, uh, a Beatles uh, program, what a surprise, that is broadcast live. Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock on WNHU in Southern Connecticut, located where on the dial, Ken? 88.7 FM. Okay, and it's also syndicated, and you'll have to, you know, later on maybe fill in the folks on where to find the show in syndication, every little thing. In addition, uh, because he likes to keep busy every waking hour, he's also (laughs) uh, the co-host of a video cast. I guess it's not a podcast. Because it's on Facebook and it's video. And uh, it's called Talk More Talk. Monday nights, 9 o'clock on Facebook. Uh, Ken Michaels, one of the four hosts of uh, of Talk More Talk. Ladies and gentlemen, enough with the introduction and enough of my yakking. Here's Ken Michaels. And that's all the time we have for this edition of... (laughs) This is like um, that Mighty Python sketch with the quiz show. (laughs) (laughs) And also with us... Uh, this show would grind to a halt without his presence. Alan Cozen has been uh, a music critic, music journalist, and a writer for uh, many decades. He spent uh, a bunch of decades, it says four over here, as the New York Times music critic uh, with uh, uh, expertise in classical music. He's also been the author of numerous, numerous Beatles books, to name two, The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something how the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, changed everything. And he's still writing, and you can catch his work uh, these days in the Wall Street Journal. I think also it'll still pop up New York Times, right, mm-hmm. Alan? Yep. And, and, um, and various other uh, uh, publications, not highlights for children. Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Cozen. Thank you, Darren, and hello, everyone. Uh- at least I don't think you've ever contributed to Highlights for Children. No, I don't think I have. All right. Well, Alan's here, and Ken is here, and I'm here, and it's time for another Things We Said Today. And um, a little later on, we'll get into the main topic. What is it? I'm not going to tell you. You have to wait. I'm going to hand it over to Ken Michaels because it's news time. All right. Thank you, Darren. Uh, hundreds That's all of the years. time we have for the news today. <laughs> for, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, you were at FUV for hundreds of years, huh? Hundreds of years, yes. Okay. Yes, so, and I'm... <laughs> the Gandalf and I walk of WFUV. Like I'm of, <laughs> I, I'm, I walk like I'm hundreds of years old. Okay. <laughs> My 40 years of doing Beatles radio is, is nothing compared to hundreds of years at FUV. <laughs> but anyway, Beatle news. Let's start with um, what I think for, for some of our listeners would be probably be the most important and it's for the beetle collector a new box set of the beetle singles will be coming out on november the 22nd including 23 vinyl seven inch singles all housed in faithfully reproduced international picture sleeves along with a 40 page booklet of photos ephemera (laughs) <laughs> that's what the press release is and uh detailed essays by beatles historian kevin howlett Kevin's been pretty busy these days, hasn't he? Mm-hmm. These singles, along with an exclusive new double A side single for the Beatles' two hits from the 90s, Free as a Bird and Real Love, are newly remastered from the original multi track master tapes and cut for vinyl at Abbey Road Studios for a limited edition box set. 
November 22nd is the same date for the release of Paul McCartney's new single for Record Store Day and Black Friday. Two songs from the Egypt Station Sessions, never before released, Home Tonight and In a Hurry, available on 7-inch vinyl with 12,000 copies made and digitally. So November 22nd, a very busy day for Beatle fans right there. And I think the McCartney single is a picture disc, is it not? Um, I haven't seen. I- I've seen pictures of it, unless it's the sleeve. I got the impression it was a picture disc, but anyway. Okay. Okay. Uh, either way, I'll be getting it. Uh, Ringo Starr will be part of a conversation with David Lynch and photographer Henry Diltz to promote Ringo's new book of photos, which is called Another Day in the Life, which has just been released. This is going to take place October 29th at 8 p.m. at the Saban Theater in Beverly Hills. I haven't heard if it's going to be streamed or not, but I'm sure it's probably going to end up on YouTube. Have either of you seen uh, Ringo's new book? Um, Yeah, I have the Genesis version of it. Okay. What do you think, Alan? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the first few... It, or, yeah, the earlier books that he put out have a lot more sort of Beatles-related content. I think this one had some pictures of of his band, you know, that he took on tour. But mostly it's like pictures of, you know, flowers and rocks and whatever. And um, a little less interested in a Ringo picture of a flower or a rock than, I mean, the rock might be an exaggeration. It's, uh, you know, I paged through it basically once and put it up on the shelf. And uh, it's, you know, I'm sure he's a wonderful photographer and, you know, it's great, but not that interesting to me. Mm, Okay. A lot of nature (laughs) photos then. No, Uh, the book actually was available earlier in the year, was it not? Unless I've been reading about, I've been hearing about it for some time because it seems like it's been out already. The Genesis one has been out for a really long time. Like, I can't remember when it turned up, actually. Uh, (laughs) Probably not a year ago, but maybe six months ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Genesis edition, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, but the mass market one has just come out. That's probably what I'm thinking of. (laughs) All right. An interesting bit of information comes from Elton John's new autobiography, which is called Me. And it's now officially out. In the book, Elton reveals, I don't know if you guys heard about this, that uh, two years after John Lennon died, Yoko Ono summoned Elton to the Dakota and asked Elton if he'd finish up some demos that John had recorded. So this was long before Yoko gave Paul a cassette tape of songs for the Beatles to record for their anthology series. Mm -hmm. Elton turned down this offer. He is quoted in the book as saying, I thought it was too soon. The time wasn't right. Actually, I didn't think the time would ever be right. Just the thought of it freaked me out. I thought it was horrible. Yoko was insistent, but so was I. So it was a very uncomfortable meeting. End of quote there. Interesting. Yeah. It turned out that these songs ended up on Milk and Honey. And uh, Yoko released them as they were. But it's really fascinating to think that Yoko thought of Elton, Mm -hmm. considering his friendship with John Lennon, to work on those songs. And uh, ironically, Ringo's new album, What's My Name, which is coming out next week, has his version of one of those songs, Girl Old With Me, with Paul McCartney, which we should talk about in a moment. So interesting about this. I I never heard this before, but we all know that Elton John is... um, you know, very frank <laughs> and, uh, you know, blunt. And he's, you know, very honest. But I I certainly never knew that he was approached by Yoko to do this. I mean, the thought of Yoko being insistent. You will record these. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's interesting. I, I can't wait to read that whole book. I just got, it's got to be like brimming with fascinating stories. Hmm. Because Elton John's such a character and has such a incredible story and incredible career, and yeah, there's so much to cover of his life. But uh, yeah, but very interesting to me. And as long as we just mentioned uh, Ringo's recording of "Grow Old with Me," what do you guys think of it? We're going to be covering Ringo's new album in our next show. But since "Grow Old with Me" is now out, what uh, what are your impressions of it, Darren? How about you? I like it. 
I don't love it. I like it. There's something about the strings that doesn't sit well with me. I cannot put my finger on it the way they sound. Or there's, uh, but then again, I'm not also listening in the best um, with the best equipment. You know, these these are advanced audio files, uh, advanced releases. Uh, in the good old days, it would have been an advanced CD, which would have been fine. You know, listening uh, through it through uh, little portable speakers and iPhones and iPads and whatnot. So I, I'm really looking forward to the album coming out and slapping the CD uh, in. But so far, it's, it's 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 really nice. It's poignant. It's a it's a really interesting song because you get if you have that kind of general generalized is that a word <laughs> uh, a, a opinion of John being the rock and roller and Paul being uh, more of the balladeer, which we all know isn't isn't necessarily the case. It is such a sweet song, and hearing it finished uh, by someone else. Is it really, you know, shows you the, the other side of John Lennon, the songwriter. I like it. I like it. Well, you know, apart from John's demo of the song on Milk and Honey and the version that appeared on the John Lennon anthology box set with the orchestration from George Martin and Giles also was involved with it. There have been cover versions of yeah. the song, like uh, uh, um, Glenn Campbell did a really good version of it. And oh, I didn't know. Uh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Um, Roseanne Cash or Mary Chapin no. Carpenter? Mary Chapin Carpenter actually right. had it. Her version actually was a top ten hit on the adult contemporary charts here in America. Okay. Right. So yeah, Alan, what are your thoughts? Uh, pretty similar to Darren's. Uh, you know, I sort of like it. Uh, um, it's it's okay. Uh, you know, it's a cover of a really good song, and uh, you know, Ringo has some. Uh, sort of you know emotional closeness to it i think uh i'm a little perplexed by the story about you know um you mm. know, ringo getting to hear the the bermuda demo and uh john hadn't put it out and saying ringo this could be for you ringo at the end i mean first of all i'd always heard that that was to do with life begins at 40 this can be for you, Ringo. But maybe he said it about a bunch of songs. I don't know. I haven't gone back to the, the you know, the like 12 discs of demos to listen to um, to the demo of it and see what's on there. But uh, I thought that was about Nobody Told Me because we heard that John wrote that for Ringo. Yeah, and I thought it was Life Begins at 40. But uh, yeah, obviously it's been a while since we've... Uh, gone through those demos or at least i have so uh i'll have to before we meet again to talk about ringos i'll sort of dig those out and go through them you know but it's it's an okay uh performance and it's probably one of the highlights of the album i i think i would say uh so you know otherwise i think i i will weigh in again in a couple of weeks when we reconvene to talk about that yeah i kind of enjoy it you know, I'm not blown away by it, but I do like this particular arrangement. I like the fact that Jack Douglas didn't take the same approach as the George Martin produced version mm -hmm. of the song and just have, you know, orchestration behind it. And I like Joe Walsh's guitar playing on it. And I think um, Ringo's vocals are just, you know, very poignant, very nice. I don't think he's straining you know, at all to, to sing the song. It's just a, a nice version. The thing about it is, though, that, you know, you're told that Paul McCartney is on harmony vocal. You can hear some harmony vocal, but unless you told me it was Paul, I wouldn't know it was Paul. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, there isn't that much of McCartney on the harmony vocal, and the bass playing is nice on there. There's some nice bass lines in the song from him. But, um, yeah, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy this version. The only thing that I'm kind of perplexed about is that, and, and I hope that we can get a full story behind the songs that Yoko gave to Paul for the anthology, because it was always my understanding that they were given Free as a Bird, Real Love, Now and Then, and Grow Old With Me. Mm -hmm. and, no, and Now and Then they were working on, but George wasn't happy with it, and they stopped recording, the, you know, and... To this day, there are lots of fans that wish that Paul and Ringo would finish it up, but George wasn't happy with it, and he wasn't happy with a, a loud hum that was in the recording right. uh, uh, of John's recording. 
And I've also heard Grow Old With Me was in the mix, but you never hear anything about whether they ever considered doing anything with it. I can't imagine that Grow Old With Me is a new song to Ringo. I would hope that he'd be aware of all of John's work or all the solo work of the Beatles. But but he talks know. as if it's a new song to him. That's the funny thing, you know, that that's what what I find perplexing. He he talks about it as if it didn't come out on on Milk and Honey and you know, and then the later orchestrated version. So does that mean he doesn't pay attention to the others releases? I don't know. I don't know. It's baffling to me. <laughs> Anyway. I think it might be a, another case of like our knowledge of the Beatles uh, is so in depth, and the actual musicians aren't uh, turning their own careers into you know uh, uh, things that they have memorized. John, maybe Ringo did hear it, you know, uh, twenty five years ago and doesn't remember. Yeah. You know, and now is it's being represented to him in a different context from Jack Douglas and hey, listen to what John says or you know, on this demo and, and who's to say John I would imagine John was was recording demos fairly frequently and not all in one shot, not all in one day or two in nineteen eighty. And um from what I've read about what was going to be uh, can't stop lightning that it seemed to that album seemed to develop slowly this guest this guest plans with that guest meeting with john like to participate a month later you know dates were set you know so john's probably writing and writing and writing now as the uh, dam is burst in 1980 and thinking oh this would work for ringo oh this would work for ringo Mm-hmm. You know, Ringo's on his mind. Oh, yeah, I'm going to just, this is Ringo. This is good for you. You know what I mean? And next thing you know, mm. he said it a bunch of times on all these tapes. Again, I'm just assuming that's what could be going on here. Mm-hmm. So you think fans are reading too much into that then? Possibly. Possibly. It- yeah. And I've also heard that, uh, that of course, Free is a Bird, Real Love, and more times than not, I've heard now and then. But I think I've heard also in the past, Grow Old With Me mentioned, but not as often as Now and Then. Now and Then's the one that I was kind of always under the impression was the one they started on and uh, didn't get beyond a day's worth of sessions, I think, before That's George right. said, no, no you know, this isn't going to work. That's what I thought this was going to be, because uh, I could say it now, when, and I guess we talked about this, when I saw Ringo and his all-star band at uh, the South Street Seaport at the, the rooftop at Pier 17 in New York City at the end of August, Jack Douglas was sitting behind me on one side. Mark Rivera was behind me on the other side. I had better seats than them. And uh, Jack was telling, he was all excited, and he was telling me about, but he didn't tell me what song. Uh, but he was telling me, I was ex- and he even had mentioned that they're back in March at Beatle Fest, at the Fest for Beatles fans in, New- in Jersey City, that they were working on something very, very special. And uh, from the way uh, Jack was talking about it at the Ringo show in August, was leading me to believe that it might be now and then. Uh, and then Jack asked me not to, you know, talk publicly yet. But the news will be coming out soon enough. And I was a little surprised it was Grow Old With Me because I thought it was going to be now and then. You know, because Paul has mentioned he would wants to get it finished and out there. This might have been the perfect way to do it. You know, mm. make it a Ringo song and uh, build off what they had, you know, what work had been done in the mid-90s. Not only that, weren't there words to the effect that somehow... They used some guitar playing from George and mixed it into the song so that he's represented on the record as well. Grow Old With Me, this one, the new version? Yeah. I haven't heard that. He, Jack gave me the impression he, that it was special for, for, for them. I don't remember how he worded it. And that's what made me think somehow George is going to be tied in with this. But I would think that it would be, you know, with all the publicity about... Joe Walsh on guitar, Paul's on bass, and we'd be in the hearing. And George, you know, there's a riff of George's that that was incorporated. Mm. You know, so I would I would don't think that would be kept secret. If, if George is in there, we'd know it. 
Yeah. Okay. You know, as someone who truly loves Grow Old With Me as a song, it's hard for me to imagine if the three surviving Beatles had heard it at the time of the Beatles anthology, they wouldn't want to do something with that song. Because it really is a gorgeous song. And as John said, he wishes or he wished that it would be a wedding song, used as a wedding song. And uh, I agree with him. (laughs) It's that good. It's a very beautiful song. It should be a classic. And for the other Beatles not to recognize that, or maybe they just gave up after now and then not being satisfied with it. I don't know. Will we ever get the full story? Yeah, yeah, I I could see George being like, all right, you know, that's it. We did enough. You know, Mm. who knows what the condition of the actual, I don't know if there's more than one demo of Grow Old With Me or it's just the one that we know on Milk and Honey. Uh, We don't know the quality of the tape they were working with. And who knows in the studio, maybe George wasn't happy with what they had done with Real Love or Free as a Bird in the first place. Mm. Both accepted it and now was like, no, you know what, we're done. He did refer to those two songs as those silly Lennon songs. <laughs> so he was downplaying them, yeah. yeah. Here's a question about the singles, the single box set. Which versions of Free as a Bird and Real Love are going to be on the single? Or will it be oh. a third version? <laughs> <laughs> well, since I'm pretty sure you're going to get it, Alan, <laughs> you'll be able to tell us. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know. <laughs> Okay. All right. One last thing here. John Lennon's early childhood home on Allerton Road, where he lived with his mother, Julia, has now been converted into an Airbnb. John would later frequent the home when he got closer to Julia shortly before her death. 60-year-old American Kelly Kupfer, a retired nurse, Bought the property after fulfilling a bucket list wish to visit Liverpool. This was after suffering a severe illness a few years ago from a brain tumor, which left her blind for nine months and affected her speech, and it's taken her this time to fully recover. After a guided tour of Liverpool's top Beatles hotspots, Kelly wondered why nobody had started an Airbnb to let people into their homes. And in 2016, the property went on the market, and sold for £325,000, and Kelly snatched it up. In the process, Kelly got to meet John's family, and they wanted to visit. They hadn't been there in nearly 50 years. And the property has now undergone a huge restoration with the help of Liverpool Beatles tour guide Jackie Spencer Mm -hmm. and Lennon family members, half-sister Julia Baird and cousin David Birch. Kelly has filled the house with carefully thought-out memorabilia and some never-before-seen pictures provided by Lennon's family. The furniture is set in the same way the family had it when they lived there, with frames and plaques to explain the artifacts placed around the home. And in the back garden, there is actually a soundproof recording studio where bands and artists can record their songs or just want to hang out and play some tunes. The rooms have also been given titles after family members who live there, and Kelly says this has been a labor of love. And the house will start taking bookings later this year. So you mean you can ask if you could stay in the twitchy room? I We have to find out about that. <laughs> okay. See if we can get uh, Jackie Spencer's email or something or, uh, or this woman, Kelly Kupfer. Mm-hmm. Or maybe there's a website for it. I'll look into that. Okay. All right. So on to our topic for the show. And back All right. You, Karen. All right. Thank you, Ken. With all the attention being given to Abbey Road on its 50th anniversary, there has been uh, a re- renewed discussions about uh, an audio recording of a meeting that took place uh, in the first half of September 1969, a mere two or three weeks before Abbey Road was to be released. So the album wasn't out yet. Uh, it was a business meeting that Paul was at, John was at, George was at. But Ringo was not there because Ringo was ill and was in the hospital. So the meeting was recorded uh, so that Ringo could hear what they discussed and what they uh, had settled on in this in this particular meeting. And during the meeting, the topic of the next album came up and a new single for release by year's end. And we have spent the past 50 years referring to Abbey Road as being the last Beatle album recorded. And the Beatles went into these sessions 
with the understanding that this was going to be their final album. But that's not according to what was discussed in this tape. And this tape is not newly discovered. This tape has been out there, has been heard, has been documented uh, over the years. But only now has renewed attention been given to it. Again, as we look at Abbey Road 50 years later and September 1969, uh, that, you know, folks are starting to, you know, talk about this tape again and contradictions. Maybe the Beatles didn't record Abbey Road to be their final album, or maybe they did. I'm very confused myself. So I'm going to sit in two chairs. Uh, I'm going to be a co-host and I'm also going to be uh, a fan and listener now uh, and edumacate myself. Uh, now, Alan Cozen uh, has... Uh, you know, really discussed at length with us when we're not, you know, off away from the show about the tape. We've debated and we decided this was a good topic for a show. And so, you know, let's let's uh, Alan, let me turn it over to you and explain the recording, the tape, the meeting, what was said, what we've, you know, been under the impression uh, of uh, where the Beatles stood with their future uh, all these years and uh, hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Darren. I, I, I guess I should say that um, the reason it's being handed over to me is because I've heard the tape. Um, I've heard it a few times and have been able to take notes, and um, I think I sort of have a reasonable understanding of what's going on in it, but there are a lot of myths and fantasies already developing, developing about this tape, and, uh, you know, I should say from the start that what anybody has heard with the exception of the person who owns the original tape is about six minutes of the meeting and the meeting lasted you know 50 minutes or so you know it, it there so there is quite a lot more to this meeting than what anybody has heard uh, and who has been discussing this uh, at such great length um, and I think it's kind of important to say that because we're talking about fragments. Now, why are we talking about fragments? The person who owned this tape uh, several years ago put it up for a kind of a private auction. And he made these two snippets of the meeting available um, because probably they're, you know, they, they are definitely interesting snippets. Um, and I guess he felt that those might be the most interesting and therefore uh, get the price up to what he wanted. It, as it turned out, the bids never met the reserve price that he had set. And so he didn't sell it. So the only things that are out there at all among collectors who I guess would have been bidding on it uh, are these two fragments that's I think one's about uh, you know two and a half minutes and one's about three and a half minutes I don't remember the actual uh, timings but uh, but six minutes total or like five minutes 55 um, all right well let me can yeah. I just jump in Alan I just want to clarify so there is, as far as we know, one single tape in the possession of someone, and we can only assume that that tape has the full or maybe almost full meaning on there. Right. And this particular someone, who we don't know who it is, do we? No. No. This someone that owns the tape, he trimmed out these two snippets that have been what has been heard over the years. Right. Um, now, I should say that Anthony Fawcett, who was John's assistant and who wrote a book about John called One Day at a Time uh, that was published, I think, in 1976, heard it as well and may actually – I've heard that he actually had the tape and lost it in a house fire. Um, wait, wait. He had the six minutes, you mean? No, he had the whole tape. And that's why oh. some of the things that he quotes in his book are not on these two snippets. You know, since he was John's assistant, he had access to it. And um, from what I've heard, he had a copy, but the copy was lost in a fire. I believe he or someone else made a copy for a third person, or I guess a second person. Uh, and that's the person who wanted to auction it. And I don't know who that is. So, uh, But these two snippets adding up to about six minutes are 
the auction samples. You know, you often get a, a little auction sample, like we've got 30 seconds of World Without Love and whatever, you know. Those things sort of leak out, and then they're, they're all that anyone has. So this, in this case, is is what has, you know, barely leaked out. I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to find someone who has it. And uh, Mark Lewison is playing, I think, about 40 seconds of it on his Hornsey Roadshow. And I think, you know, everybody who has it is very sort of disinclined to let it get out. And um, I think Mark as well feels that if he were to play more than that, Apple would get upset. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if he thinks that that, that is a logical reason why he might limit it to 40 seconds um, or he may just want to make a specific point. I think the main point he wants to make is that this proves that they did not think of Abbey Road as their swan song while they were making it. And there's a lot more to be discussed about that because it, 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 it may not be as black and white as yes, they did and no, they didn't. Because, you know, George Martin thought it was. George Martin thought everything was falling apart by then and that this was deliberately meant to be their swan song. And another engineer that I interviewed Actually, this was just over a lunch. Uh, I went to a recording session that John Curlander was producing in Philadelphia. He'd become a classical producer, and he was record he was recording the Philadelphia Orchestra doing the Beethoven Second. And we went to lunch after that session, and we're talking about all sorts of Beatles things, including the CDs which had not yet been released, and all kinds of stuff. And uh, he told me that, you know, he was a junior engineer on Abbey Road, and he said that it was definitely, everyone knew that it was supposed to be their last album, and uh, and that, that that's what the whole Everest thing was about, you know. Uh, now everyone says Everest is because... Um, Jeff Emmerich's cigarettes were Everest cigarettes and he left them all over the studio and they decided to name the album Everest. Uh, and that could be the beginning of why they wanted to call it Everest, but then they were going to be flown to Mount Everest for the cover. Um, and the way John Curlander interpreted it, I mean, when he told me the story, he didn't even say anything about Jeff Emmerich's cigarettes. He said they wanted to call it Everest as a way of saying that they were going out on top. Uh, at their highest, at their peak, and that they were basically making a statement, and, and part of the statement was going to be being flown to Everest and photographed on Mount Everest. Um, and he said they all agreed. There were no debates about it. No, no, no one didn't want to go. But then in the end, the mixing sessions ran long, and uh, and they just sort of couldn't be bothered as well, you know, to actually get it together and go until Paul said, let's go out in the street and take a cover. And then it became Abbey Road. So that sort of syncs up with our John Kosh interview from last time. A little. And, and yet we've heard many times Ringo has said, the we baby. never went into the, into the album thinking this is our last album or our last song. And he's, he just said it recently, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, it could be a lot of things. It could be that they didn't go in that way, although George Martin, till, when he told the story, it was, you know, we want to get together and make one last album, you know, in the way you always used to do it. I don't know, that could be George Martin embellishing on what he heard. Uh, it, I can't explain why John Curlander felt the way he did, but he definitely felt that way. You know, it could very well be that that at a certain point they did feel that because there had been so many tensions during the year because of the, uh, you know, wanting to buy Northern songs, wanting to buy uh, NEMS, you know. I mean, NEMS still owned a piece of them. Even though Brian Epstein was dead, NEMS was taking a 20% commission on their recording sales. So they wanted to buy NEMS, not because they wanted a management company, but because they wanted basically to get that 20% return to them. And Clive Epstein really did not want to run a pop empire. He didn't have his brother's, uh, you know, theatricality and, and feeling about, you know, what can sell and all that. He didn't like the rock world very much. He really just wanted to be a Liverpool 
furniture salesman, <laughs> you know, that's, I mean, that, it, I'm not saying that pejoratively, that's what he liked, that's what he wanted to do. Um, so he wanted to sell NEMS and had to sell NEMS because the death taxes on Brian's estate were already, you know, overdue and pretty hefty. So selling NEMS would have let him pay the tax and get it off his hands. For the Beatles, they were just putting Apple together and uh, having a structure of a company might have been useful, uh, but it, but mainly they wanted to get their royalty back, their 20% you know, cut of the royalties back from uh, from NEMS. At the same time, there was Northern Songs, and you've got all of this going on. They're trying to buy Northern Songs. Uh, Lou, uh, Lou Grade is also bidding on it. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a complete mess and a lot of back and forth. I mean, you know, Adrian Sinclair and I are including all of this stuff in the very beginning of our McCartney legacy book because it sets the stage for where Paul is at by the time he's recording his first album. So, and we also, in fact, deal with this meeting that we're about to talk about. So it, it could very well be that when they went into the Abbey Road sessions, I mean, you've got all of those things I just mentioned, plus the fact that three of them wanted Alan Klein to represent them, and Paul didn't want Alan Klein to represent them. Uh, in May, they signed a contract with Klein. Uh, I think Paul didn't sign it, uh, but for the first time, they decided that, okay, the rules of Apple's uh, incorporation lets the board of directors do things by majority vote, and three to one is a majority. So Paul's not wanting to do that uh, didn't matter. And uh, the way Paul talks about it is this is the first time that the Beatles made a decision that was not unanimous. And he felt betrayed by that. John, meanwhile, is feeling betrayed because he finds out that Paul is buying shares of Northern Songs behind his back. Everybody is angry at everybody, almost, except no one's angry at Ringo, of course, because that never happens. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, so they go into Abbey Road and, uh, you know, it could very well be that they had some thought of it being their their swan song but had such a good time making it and that the result was so good that maybe they thought okay you know maybe we can put all this business stuff behind us and keep going and that brings us to this meeting so the meeting was so far as we can figure on september 9th or september 8th mark lewison says september 8th not really that sure uh, but we know that it happened when Ringo was in the hospital, and in fact, they even say at the beginning of the tape that they're making this tape for Ringo, and George says, uh, hope, you're, hope you're feeling better. So in solid state, Ken Womack uh, has, I think he dates it into October, he has it after John's divorce announcement, you know, him coming in and saying, I want a divorce, the group is broken up. So the way he describes it is he wanted a divorce and then he wanted an undivorce. But actually, you can date this tape just by looking up when Ringo was in the hospital. And this was reported in the press. Um, I have a New York Times clip. I think it actually might have been AP originally. Uh, I have a, a cutting from the New York Times that says Ringo is in the hospital and, you know, with a gastrointestinal thing. And and so now we, we have a rough date for it because the article appeared on the 9th. So that was like a, a Tuesday. So this meeting, if it was on the 8th, would have been a Monday, I think. Um, so, you know, they, they say hello to Ringo. They wish him, uh, you know, better health. And then John gets right down to it, and he says, so the first thing is dividing time on the albums. He, he proposes this idea of four for him, four for Paul, four for George, and two for Ringo. I think in the Anthony Fawcett version, it said two for Ringo if he wants it. Um, I didn't hear him say if he wants it on the tape, but uh, it was just four, 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 two. 
And it seems pretty clear. In fact, I think John says, I've discussed it. You know, we've discussed this already, all of us in the room here. We're just saying this so to you, Ringo, so that you know what's been discussed. They had all agreed on it. And the next thing John wants is to say that, and from now on, we're going to sort of like get rid of the myth of the Lennon-McCartney songwriting partnership. My songs will be listed as John. Paul's songs will be listed as Paul. And they have a little discussion about whether contractually they can do that. And, and, and John says, and this is really kind of interesting, John says we want to do it in a way that won't get the press saying, ah, Beatles splitting, you know, John and Paul, separate credits, the Beatles are splitting again, you know, they wanted to avoid all that Beatles splitting uh, rumor, which is really kind of interesting since most of the Beatles splitting rumor up to this point had to do with interviews John gave saying, you know, that they were going to be doing separate things and he wanted to do things with Yoko and, you know, and that's the way it seemed to be going. So... Anyway, it, it seems that John, at this moment, was all fired up with the idea of continuing, which is really kind of unusual, but okay. I mean, it's clearly what's happening. A few years ago, uh, and I think we talked about it on the show then, a few years ago, Dave Morell got a copy of this tape. And went on to I think it was Breakfast with the Beatles, one of the one of these shows. And uh, he he was Fabcast. Fabcast. Oh yeah, that's right. It was his yeah, own yeah. his own uh, yeah. right. And he um he presented the tape as quite different from what I hear. I mean, he says that you know John proposes doing the you know four 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 two split for the songs, and nobody's that interested. And then John proposes doing a Christmas single and nobody's interested. And then John says, so that's it for the Beatles. Well, John does say, so that's it for the Beatles. But he says it in the way you would say as an agenda item. Like, I have now gone through the agenda on the things that have to do with the Beatles. So that's it for the Beatles. Let's move on to the next item, okay? Mm. Uh, it wasn't like, so that's it for the Beatles. I guess we have to break up because you guys don't want to do an album in a single. So the first item is the 4442. The second item is, and when we put this out now, my songs will be credited to me. Paul's songs will be credited to Paul. The third item, which um, I don't know, it sounded to me like it was Paul who said it, but um, someone else who knows the tape pretty well thought it was Neil, um, says, do you want to put out a, a single? Do you want to make a single before Christmas? John says, yeah, that'd be, that'd be a good idea. And the rest of them, you, you don't hear what their reaction is so much. Uh, no one, No one says no. John and Paul discuss the fact that, you know, it used to be that when it was time to do a single, they would go write a single. Because what John is saying is, okay, now, you know, now that we have this new sort of um, egalitarian approach to all of our stuff, what we'll all do is we will each bring in our proposal for the song to record as a single for Christmas, and we will pick the best one. You know, and everyone seems okay with that too. So, you know, when he finally says, uh, you know, that's it for the Beatles, it's that like, okay, these are the agenda items. We have now agreed upon them and on to the next thing. So we don't really know what the next thing is because that's the end of that segment. When we come in again in the second segment, <laughs> it's basically everyone talking about starting talking about George's songs and Paul says basically you know I, I didn't think your songs were any good or all that good I think he says all that good I didn't think your songs were all that good until this year um, other versions of this that I've seen in print or on the internet or I think in Fawcett kind of soften that a bit where, you know, they have Paul saying, but now your songs are as good as ours. He doesn't say that. He just says, I didn't think until this year that they were 
all that good. And George says, well, you know, other people liked them, you know, all, da- all down the line. Other people have liked them. That's in the Fawcett book, that all down the line part. And, uh, and John says, yeah, you know, he's right. Uh, other people have, people have come to me and said George's stuff is better lately. And, you know, then they go on a little bit more about George's songs. But John then turns the discussion to Paul's songs. And this part is also pretty much in the Fawcett book, too. John, uh, apparently someplace in this 50-minute meeting, Paul had said something to the effect of, okay, he wasn't like, he wasn't married to the idea of Maxwell and obla di obla da. He just liked them and wanted to do them. And so they did them. And John is saying, okay, you know, you said that, you weren't that crazy about those songs and we didn't dig them at all. So if the guy who wrote them didn't dig them, why did we all have to do them? And if you write a song like that, that's like that kind of music that, you know, John, uh, not on this tape, but possibly somewhere in the missing, you know, 40 some odd minutes might have called granny music. Um, We know that he, in any case, later referred to Paul's stuff like Obla Di Obla Da and Maxwell as granny music. Uh, He's saying, basically, if you're you're writing this kind of song, why don't you just give it to basically one of our Apple artists who might like it and might need a single with it, but we don't need a single with it. You know, like, why not give it to Mary Hopkin uh, was the example he used. Not sure I can see Mary Hopkin doing Maxwell's Silver Hammer. She wasn't really... (laughs) He didn't have that dark edge that you need. Um, But in any case, John is then making a distinction between album tracks and singles. And it's really kind of interesting because what he's saying is, you know, I can see how for a single, you might want to really be sort of, you know, street level popular in a way, you know, that that you want a track out there that everyone's going to love and sing along and all that stuff. But for an album track... We don't have to do that. We can do whatever we want, you know? And you can just imagine that John is thinking, no, no, the album track should be Revolution 9, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the single, okay, we put out Obla D as a single, but, you know, the album tracks, we can do whatever we want. He's making a real distinction. He's making a kind of FMAM distinction, you know? The album tracks are the cool stuff. The singles are the stuff that they put out to have a hit. Mm-hmm. So... And that's basically about as far as the six minutes goes. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's those are those are the topics that are discussed in the six minutes that have been heard. You get a little bit extra from Anthony Fawcett. Anthony Fawcett adds the part about George saying, "You know, you guys weren't." there for some of my sessions or John wasn't uh, and John saying well you had Eric Clapton none of that is on these two snippets that I've heard but it's in the Anthony Fawcett book and uh, you know since since the Anthony Fawcett book is pretty accurate on the stuff that I did here except for softening you know Paul's criticism of George a bit I think, you know, you can probably take with a reasonable amount of certainty the other stuff that's in the Fawcett version uh, as as being legit, too. So that's that, you know. I, um, what else can I tell you? Well, so question. I'll... Oh, <laughs> go, go ahead. Go ahead, Ken. Raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, turn on your camera. <laughs> I'll tell you, Alan, um, I was fascinated by this when I when I heard about it when it was in the media recently. And I'm kind of surprised that I didn't remember it being in Anthony Fawcett's book since I read it a long time ago. But there are certain things that you said there that I wasn't even aware of. But it, it made me realize that John, in particular, put a lot of thought into this. It wasn't just one particular angle of the Beatles. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's the the four 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 and two aspect of it. It's John songs being now listed as John Lennon and not Lennon and McCartney. Same thing with Paul songs, separating the singles from the albums and thinking of it in a different way, like you were just saying. And at that moment in time, he seemed pretty serious about this. Mm-hmm. And 
as you said, they had already agreed to do this. This wasn't like they were discussing it and and, and just um, trying to decide whether or not they were going to do this and then give it to Ringo. They already had decided that that would be the next the next release. And um, or, or really that that there would be an extra release in, in any case. Yeah. I don't think they're, they're not really talking specifics. They're not saying dates to go into the studio again. But of course, any of that could have been in the missing 40 some odd minutes. We just don't know. That's true. And it's really fascinating also that shortly after this, John left to do the concert with Live Peace in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And then everything everything changed right after that. Everything changed. I think John had, um, you know, apart from the usual nerves that he had going on stage and, you know, throwing up before going out and all that stuff, I think John had a great time in Toronto. And it was a great time because, first of all, he was able to do a live version of Cold Turkey, which apparently, and this may also be in the 40 40 minutes that are are missing, uh, the Beatles didn't want to do, didn't feel that that was the image of themselves they wanted to project. And so here he has his new song in a band with Eric Clapton and uh, surrounded by oldies and Give Peace a Chance. And then the second half of that show, Yoko doing her thing all over you, as he put it at the concert. And nobody is telling him no. Nobody can tell him no. He's John Lennon. And these guys, even Eric Clapton, are, you know, sidemen on this occasion. And I think that really appealed to him. Here he can now work with whoever he wants, put out an album where he doesn't have to give four songs to Paul, four songs to George, and two to Ringo. Um, He can give some to Yoko if he wants, or or she wants. Um, And there's no negotiation, there's no dynamic of give and take, it's just this is my show, this is my thing. I can do exactly what I want. I had a great time trying it out. And now, one week after the concert, I'm going to go in and say, hey, I want a divorce, you know, while Paul is talking about maybe touring little venues and, you know, and giving surprise concerts and stuff like that. You know, John, uh, you know, Paul has been trying to get them into that mindset since, I think, a little bit before the Let It Be sessions began. Mm. Um So, because, I mean, there was talk, when the White Album came out, there was talk at the end of the year, of uh, end of 68, of them playing a bunch of shows in various venues. The the last one that was mentioned was the Roundhouse. And George, even in interviews in, I think, NME or Melody Maker, or one of those British papers, even mentioned it, you know, we're, we're... thinking of doing a show at the roundhouse and the negotiations with the people at the roundhouse got to be a bit fraught and they ended up not doing it and decided that they would convene after new year's by then paul had a new idea we'll do a tv show uh where we'll show us working on new stuff and we'll do a concert and record the new stuff live and that's what we'll do and they all agree to that but not everybody was, uh, you know, some of them were a little half-hearted about it. And Ringo had to start filming in February. He was committed to doing Magic Christian. So that meant they had only a month for those sessions, several days of which were wasted by Magic Alex's non-working studio being brought into Savile Row being looked at by the EMI guys and then being thrown in the trash while EMI had to bring in, you know, portable equipment to record the album. Uh, That cost them a couple of days that, you know, it at a point where they only had a few days left. So um, yeah, that was, that was a bit fraught, but, um, but yeah, so Paul, after that, you know, tried to get them to go on the road and do these little venues, kind of like what he did with Wings in 1972, the very first Wings tour, you know, turning up at a university and saying, can we play? Imagine if it was the Beatles. <laughs> and, no, you can't play here. We don't want you. <laughs> yeah, right. So that's what he's proposing. And while he's proposing that, that's when John announced 
I want a divorce, just like from Cynthia. I want to be out of the group. By the way, there is a tape of that meeting, too, because George wasn't there. George was in George was mm. visiting his mother, who was sick, was, um, I think, had cancer. Um, so they tape that for George. I'd love to hear that one, too, really. <laughs> <laughs> that one hasn't... Uh... No, no that snippets even. From... Exists, but nobody has, seems to have heard it or... No, haven't run into anyone who's heard it, but... So, uh, how many weeks are between the meeting uh, on the 8th or 9th of September and the one where John says, that's I the... want a divorce? Yeah, that's the 20th. So, here's the timeline. The meeting is on the 8th or 9th. Let's say the 8th, Okay. And because, you know, Mark doesn't pick dates for nothing. I mean, he may have some other reasons to know that this was the 8th. And so I'm willing to go with that. The Toronto show was on the 13th. And the divorce announcement was on the 20th. Now, they also met on the 19th to sign the new contract that Alan Klein had negotiated with Capital and EMI. He did separate negotiations and they had signed that. And so when John said, I want a divorce, which he also said, he's, he told Eric Clapton in the band when he was in Toronto, and he told Klein. Now, Klein says, please don't say this publicly, you know, any of you. Uh, and obviously, from, you know, from Klein's point of view, uh, you know, it's going to look like he's negotiating in bad faith if they sign a contract on the 19th and break up on the 20th, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, even Klein, uh, you know, Klein knew what his reputation was anyway. And, like, that isn't what he needed. Um, because Klein also, I think, felt that he could persuade John to stay. You know, do whatever you want. You know, I mean, John already had the freedom to work with Yoko, to make records with Yoko. He put out Two Virgins, Life with the Lions, which we haven't mentioned lately, uh, the wedding album, and now Live Peace in Toronto was in the can. Uh, so, and he also had been playing live, you know, with Yoko. Besides Live Peace in Toronto, he did that thing in Cambridge, it basically appeared at Yoko's show playing guitar or getting feedback. Uh, so, it's not as if, you know, I think the, the argument Klein would have made to John is, look, you can do anything you want to do with Yoko by yourself, you name it. But, you know, just keep it together with the Beatles as well, because that's your meal ticket, you know. I have really nothing to add or say. Just very fascinating. It was riveted. Uh, like I said, now I'm sitting in my, in my chair as a listener and fan, not as a co-host. But it just seems, it, it, I don't know, all of this just seems to be the natural progression of a very, uh, you know, a band that was on some degree of thin ice. There was a new chapter coming as businessmen, new contracts, and they were growing up, maturing, finding their own individual interests. And uh, almost like uh, as the wind changed direction, their frames of mind changed. Mm. Right. Their point of view rather changed better. You know, their opinions and what they wanted, their needs, their wants. You know, I know for myself, if I say something one day, three weeks later, I'm very possibly completely changed my mind. Yeah, I mean, especially John, you know, the, the rest of them were, I think, prepared to keep going. And, you know, George... As far as far ahead as May 1970, when when um, Howard Smith interviewed him, he seemed to feel that, yeah, this is just sort of a blip. We'll get back together. Now, that's after Paul has made his announcement via press release in the press copies for his first album, saying that he didn't envision working with the Beatles again. This is like uh, 20 days after that, that George gave this interview. And he basically said, yeah, you know, I think we'll I think we'll get back together. And, and he basically characterized the disputes between them, the business disputes between them as being the three of us made a decision about what we wanted to do. And one person didn't want to do it. And the thing is, when I go home every day, I'm not going home to Alan Klein. 
the implication being, you know, Paul's going home to Linda and the Eastmans are the other side of this from, from their point of view. Now we can fast forward a few years and, you know, discover that in the end, Paul was right. And the rest of them had to sue to get out of the contract with Klein. And if they had just listened to him in the first place, I mean, the Eastman's like, I can see how, you know, in any partnership, you're not going to have one partner's in-laws be your manager. But the Eastman's made Paul a billionaire (laughs) and and the others were, uh, you know, didn't do quite that well until, you know, way later when they finally, you know, sort of realized they needed to do some, you know, different business stuff that we don't really hear that much about apart from John buying and selling cows and all that, or Yoko doing it on John's behalf. Sometimes you wonder, you know, the reason why Paul became as wealthy as he is now, apart from all the record sales, is because he became involved with music publishing and owning songs. Yeah. And who, who got who got Paul involved in that? The, the Eastman Eastmans. family. Yeah. So if they could do that for Paul, can you even begin to imagine what they could have done for the Beatles? Yeah. 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 So yeah, you know? then, then at some point in 1977, there would be a battle between John and Paul over, I want to buy Buddy Holly songs. No, I want Buddy Holly songs. No, no. You bought Carl Perkins' stuff. I want Buddy Holly. Beatles well, you know, it could up. it could well be that oh. Apple bought all those catalogs and that they all shared in the profits. Right. You know, not right. to mention possibly, um, you know, getting the Buddy Holly, Holly catalog out on Apple Records. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's one thing I, I just I, I don't understand. And since you're more familiar with the contract that was signed with Klein, then perhaps you can explain this to me. Other than the fact that, yes, the Beatles were going to get a very high royalty rate on their records now, Mm -hmm. didn't the contract also stipulate that the Beatles would make money off each other's solo albums? You know, I don't think it stipulated that. I'd have to look at it again. I've I've got the contract um, and it's, you know, it's in legalese and it's, you know, not the most fun read. What it stipulated was... I think clearly for the first time, although there was something like it in the 67 contract, what it stipulated is that a Beatles recording and a recording by one of the Beatles counted as the same. I'm not sure that they envisioned all of the royalties from each solo album going into the Apple account as such. Um, it's possible, and it, it's it's possible that that's a reason why Paul wanted to disband Apple and be on his own so that he could be, you know, the, the receiver of his own royalties. I think that was mm. an issue for him. It could be that as Klein negotiated it, Apple was going to get the royalties for everything and then they were going to split it however they would but i'm not really sure about that i have to look that up okay and why would john lennon sign a contract with alan klein here knowing full well that he was going to quit the band yeah i mean there there are commitments that you that you're making now once you sign a contract yes i know there's there's the the increased royalty rate and that's fantastic well, first of all, it's also an increased royalty rate on the back catalog. So mm-hmm. he definitely has an interest in that happening. And the second thing is if solo albums and group albums are counted the same in the contract and towards fulfilling the contract, what has he got to lose? You know? There's no breach of contract there. Right. Because right. even the Beatles broke up and it was headline news the day they signed the contract, you still have four now artists who are going to be releasing music that is going to carry the same financial weight for them as a band album would or a single. Yeah. It's also possible that until he blurted it out, he hadn't totally decided either way. You know, I mean, it, it's could be because look, only on the eighth he was making these plans to make a new album and single with them, 
And then he went off and played the show. Maybe that changed his mind, but maybe, you know, maybe there was enough self-awareness there to say, you know what? I think this one day, I think this another day, maybe I should just keep it to myself until I'm ready. And it could be just that Paul talking about going out and playing small venues just set him off. And he Mm. said that. Um, And yet, uh, Paul, at least, thought that he was serious. You know, he's he knew John pretty well. And, uh, you know, he he went off to Scotland and, you know, feeling that, okay, the Beatles, it's over. You know, and in fact, even though he, no, they had all agreed not to say anything, and even though Paul is often credited with breaking the news in his April 10th press release uh, with his first album, he actually told a reporter for Life magazine at the end of October, the Beatles thing is over. We've exploded it, uh, partly because of things we did, partly because of things other people did, but the Beatles thing's finished. And it's in the November 7th, 1969 version of Life magazine. You can look it up. I, I believe there are copies of it online even. And he says it. The reporter was in a position, I think, where she wouldn't have been able to ask follow-up questions, but she doesn't say, um, excuse me, what do you mean by that? She gets back to her editor in London, and her editor in London doesn't say, uh, wow, you're burying the lead here. <laughs> All the way down in the third paragraph, it says the Beatles thing is over. And the readers didn't notice. I mean, you didn't see a bunch of letters in the next couple of issues of Life magazine saying, what did Paul mean when he said the Beatles thing is over? We've exploded it. It's pretty, you know, overt. My best guess is that everyone took that to mean the Beatles as for Mop Tops is over. The Beatles touring and having all the girls screaming and not being able to hear anything, that's over. You know, a a lot of people might have just interpreted it that way, that that's what he was saying, but not quite taking literally that the Beatles were over. Was this the same (laughs) article that kind of had the uh, was taking the uh, stance? All these rumors are that Paul is is dead. Uh, We tracked him down. Yeah. And that was the same article, same story. Yeah. And in fact, he's much alive and he's in Scotland. And here's our interview. That could be. And that could be another reason. They were sort of um, so busy looking for you know, whether Paul was dead or not, or what Paul had to say about being dead, that they weren't really paying attention to the actual substance that was in the interview. But yeah, that was, uh, and in fact, that's the one where, you know, it turns out to be Terrence Spencer, although uh, life credits, life credits the photos to John Graham. I think John Graham is the name they used. But it was Terrence Spencer, who I think all of our listeners will know as a photographer who shot the Beatles going back to 1963 and who knew them pretty well uh, and was a a war photographer mostly. I mean, he only began photographing the Beatles because his daughter, uh, Cara, I think her name is, uh, persuaded him because she was a, a teenager at the time and a Beatles fan. And she persuaded him to take that assignment when it you know, came his way. And so he did it and he got to be sort of friendly with them. So when Paul, Paul sees him and recognizes him, throws a bucket of kitchen waste at him Mm. um, and then punches him in the arm. And they sort of hightail it off because as uh, I think uh, Spencer says that he turned to the reporter whose name was Dorothy Bacon and said, uh, you know, I think we've worn out our welcome Uh, And then Paul kind of realized, you know, he slipped immediately back into master PR guy and realized that, like, this is not this isn't good. You know, he took he got a couple of shots of me throwing that bucket. Uh, I've never heard this. Yeah. So, um, well, when you when you um, buy a copy of McCartney Legacy in about two years, (laughs) 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 you'll read it. You'll hear it again. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, it pretty much opens this way. Uh, But 
I had thought it was um, Robert Robert Graham. I think is is the name uh, that Life credits the photos to. So you assume that therefore the team that goes up to interview him is Robert Graham and Dorothy Bacon. Dorothy Bacon is correct, but it turned out to be Terence Spencer, and. Peter Carlin Ames in his McCartney biography. I don't know if either of you've read that. I know Peter, and in fact, I proofread his book for him uh, when when he wrote it. And I was looking at that again, and he talks about Terence Spencer, and in fact, even has a quote from Terence Spencer. So I wrote to him and said, so Peter, I mean, you know, in the magazine, it says Robert Graham, and you say that it's Terrence Spencer and you talk to him and he's dead now. He died like six months after Peter talked to him. Can you tell me a little bit more about this? And he very generously sent me the transcript of the interview. Terrence Spencer had no idea who Robert Graham was. I mean, I don't even know if that was a real name, but he also said that Paul took his film, because the deal that they made, Paul chased after them caught them and said, look, I'm really sorry about that, but we came here to kind of be alone and, you know, not be bothered. And uh, I just sort of lost my temper. I'll tell you what, I'll give you an interview if you give me the role of film, because I can't have that out there. So Terrence Spencer gave him the role of film. And the deal was that Paul would then provide a bunch of Linda's pictures of the family up in Campbelltown, Scotland, where his place was, his High Park farm. And he did. Uh, And so the pictures that appear in that issue of Life magazine are Linda's pictures, but credited to Robert Graham and obtained by Terence Spencer. (laughs) So it's a, a little bit of a mystery. I mean, you know, I haven't found anyone still living who can tell me why Robert Graham got the photo credit, but um, if and again, all... we don't even know who Robert Graham is, right? Right, right. Okay. I've looked him up. I've tried right. to find info about him. You know, the fact that it's such a common name doesn't help, but I haven't been able to find any. I did find a Robert Graham who's a photographer in England, but he's younger than me, so can't be him. <laughs> Hmm. We could we could start new polls. Dead rumors now. Robert Graham is Paul McCartney. Anyway, well, uh, yeah. I mean, this is really I mean fascinating stuff. Um, Alan, thank you for uh, sharing all of this, and uh, I'm also very impressed with your recall. <laughs> yeah. Well. Do you recall Alan getting and reading the that Life article, uh, the magazine in late '69? I can't say I recall reading it back then. I I had it. Um, It was in my collection, so I must have read it back then, but I don't have specific memories of reading it. It's just, you know, once I started researching the Paul book, um, wanted to sort of get into that period because this is leading up to him recording the first album. And I said, well, wait a minute. He says right here, the Beatles thing is over. Wow, (laughs) you know. So I don't know what I would have thought of it as a, as, as a kid reading it. I probably thought he meant the Mop Top Beatles are over. You know, that's, that's, that's why that's my guess. It's the only logical guess I can, can make. Right. Interesting. Uh, and just uh, having never heard that story about Paul uh, assaulting anyone, yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, in this case, the, uh, uh, one of the two coming from All Life magazine was fascinating. Yeah. And someone he knew. So you get, and then, of course, now, of course, the the, uh, the child in me wants to know what a bucket of kitchen slop uh, contained, actually. And that today would become like a, a TMZ piece. I was punched right. by Paul McCartney <laughs> well, and had kitchen slop thrown on me. And it's a headline news in the, uh, uh, you know, in right. TMZ. So I've also subsequently found Robert Spencer's autobiography, to which he devotes maybe a page to the incident. And, you know, from his point of view, and he said this to Peter Carlin too, he said, you know, I totally did not blame Paul. We were trespassing on his, you know, he needed to be away. You know, this is part of the job. I, I totally felt for him, you know, and, but he also says in in the book um, 
that, uh, you know, I've been covering wars and conflicts and things all over the world. And the only time anyone took a swing at me <laughs> was Paul McCartney. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, well, it tells you what a difficult time that was for Paul. Yeah, it was. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so, you know, when you got it, like, like we pointed out, I think we pretty much have summed up in a nutshell that that brief period of time over the second half of 1969 was very turbulent, mm -hmm. um, where, where moods and opinions uh, were changing on a dime. Yeah. Uh, all of, all of yeah. 1969 was for them, really. Yeah. Uh, you, had, you had the pressures of being the biggest entertainment entity in, in the world, and now you're businessmen, whether you like it or not, and you can't, you know see eye to eye on all the things you need to see eye to eye about. And it was just too much. And, uh, you know, it was, you know, you didn't have any like uh, high profile in the media, in the newspaper type fights and wars. It was all, you know, they did a, actually a very good job of keeping as much of it as they could behind closed doors mm -hmm. and off tape, you know, and out of people's ears. You know, the inner the inner uh, workings of the Beatles, they did a rather remarkable job in keeping that all to themselves. Mm -hmm. That here we are 50 years later debating, well, they said this on this date and it contradicts this on this date, you know. Well, yeah. And that's the thing that, you know, when we hear about, you know, well, this completely rewrites history and uh you know that I, I I think a lot of a lot of people see all of this in black and white terms. They're breaking up or they're not breaking up. They're doing this as their last album. They're do not doing it as their last album. It probably isn't so neat. You know, it probably they're you know we forget sometimes that we're talking about human beings with the same frailties that we have, the same yeah. mood swings that we are subject to, they're subject to. Uh, you know, they they had days that they felt this way, and they had days that they felt that way, and the fact that there were four of them compound the fact that maybe one of them feels this way that day, and the other three don't, or the other three you know, in any combination of the four, it's, it's not so sort of neatly, uh, dissected and, and, uh, and, and shown, you know, you, you have to, um, you have to show what the, the different aspects of, of it were. And that's very difficult in, in a biography. Um, yeah. People so. always want a simple explanation. Right. And there is no simple explanation. It's yeah. far more complicated. And then you've got to deal with their personal lives too. I mean, John married Yoko. Paul married Linda. Mm -hmm. Yoko had a second miscarriage in, in 1969. Mm -hmm. You know, and how did that affect John and Yoko together? Mm -hmm. And Paul and Linda had Mary, you know, their first child together. All those things are into play here. And, um, you know, it's, it's very complicated. Yeah. I don't know how anyone could go into even just discussing did the Beatles know Abbey Road was their last album. You'll get so many different opinions about that and i've i've always thought that and this is only just one example here but when you record a song called the end mm -hmm. and it's the last song or what it was supposed to be the last song on side two right and <laughs> you've got ringo doing a drum solo which he never did before you've got john paul and george trading guitar solos together mm -hmm. that you never did before mm -hmm. and you have a line the love you take is equal to the love you make you know, it's yeah. like, doesn't that sound like an epitaph to you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah this was yeah. a point I made, in fact, in my when I reviewed the album in The Wall Street Journal that, you know, there's all this discussion of whether they knew it was their last or not. But I gave the, the Curlander evidence and I gave, you know, that exactly what you just said as, you know, it, it kind of does look like uh, a finale, you know, ending. And with then the I'm end. also. Yeah, I'm also thinking about um, the photos that we've been seeing recently because it's also the 50th anniversary of their last photo session together at uh, John's house at Tittenhurst Park. And Ethan Russell, the photographer, remembered that George couldn't wait to leave, mm -hmm. you know, and he was really miserable. Of course, that's one day in his life. 
Right. Can yeah, we be blowing he, that out of proportion? You know? Ethan Russell says that, uh, I think he gives the impression that he felt they were all miserable in that shoot. And yet, you know, you look at the footage that's out there of the, the film footage of that day, and they look okay. You know, Paul smiling and waving. Mm. Not that, you know, it takes much to get Paul to smile and wave if there's a camera. But, but still, you know, if he was in a really bad mood, uh, you know, he might not. So... I don't know, you know, and that was August. They still continued on for another, you know, it was another month before Abbey Road came out. I mean, all of the te- all of the questions and that they may have had in their heads, and the internal doubts and angers, and they were there in August. You know, you don't know what the frame of mind was, what a recent conversation or meeting that may have happened the day before, you know, mm-hmm. what what may have went down. Uh, you know, that now they're now they're forced to have to play nice and just stand around and have pictures taken. Uh, I hate having pictures taken. Yeah. Uh, you know, and if you're not in the mood, you know what I'm saying? And you hear you got to smile and be a beetle. But I don't want to be a beetle because just yesterday he called me, you know, whatever, you know. Yeah. You know, and then a week after that, peace, temporary, you know, and frames of mind change and opinions change. And let's make our next album with four, 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 and two. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Which actually, I was, <laughs> I think they must have wait four and four, eight, twelve. That's fourteen songs. All right. So they probably would have been all on the short side because can you get fourteen songs on one LP? Well, the British albums typically had fourteen, but the songs were all sort of short back in that day. Yeah, Couldn't that's true. Throw any seven or eight minute epics on there. Right. Interesting, just how it would have played out, or what what might they have cooked up to be the a single to come out at the end of the year, or were they talking in terms of doing a Christmas song to release as a single, or just a new song to come out for the Christmas market for the for the holiday market? I, I think, wondered about that myself. Yeah, I think probably one for the holiday market. I mean, they they didn't typically do Christmas songs except on the Christmas records, so. I don't know. I mean, who knows? Again, and that last Christmas message would have been right fresh, freshly, you know, the individually they recorded their bits for 69 and handed them over to be edited into something that tried to appear to be a unified band Christmas message. But, you know, all of the uh, tensions and arguments and had were fresh when they all recorded their bits mm-hmm. for that 69 message. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the Jock and Yono and their Beast Friends, <laughs> the John's, right. John, one of John's contributions. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, who knows uh, what they were thinking. It, it it could be that in that missing 40-plus minutes that maybe that's where John proposes putting out Cold Turkey as a Christmas single. <laughs> yeah. Right, 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 right. That and is- I also... I also find it fascinating that John at least recognizes the fact that it's a problem holding George back to two songs per album. Well, I mean, he did quit during the Let It Be sessions with that being one of the issues. Um, Mm. So, you know, he had to, he and Paul both had to know that this was what was on George's mind and that if they wanted to keep it together with George, that that had to be addressed. You know, plus also, you know, they just finished Abbey Road and something in Here Comes the Sun. I mean, no matter no matter what you thought about George's previous stuff, um, you had to recognize those two songs as, as being incredible. And, you know, even it, it's so surprising, you know, when Paul says, I, I didn't think your songs were all that much until this year. I mean, while my guitar gently weeps, for God's sake. Yeah, you know, you know, George Martin said the same thing hmm. about about George Harrison. Yeah, he said, you know, the first time I recognized that he really gave us a great song was with something. Hmm. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it just goes to show you how John Paul and George could be, you know, blind in in a way. Yeah, you uh, know what? And I always thought, don't bother me. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's George's first. Right. solo composition i mm-hmm. always thought don't bother me was up to standard with everything else just about that was on that yeah with the beatles mm-hmm. rusty I'm, I'm i'm getting me with the, beatles. With the beatles and for us meet the beatles don't bother me for a first song yeah that was really good <laughs> yeah 
Mm-hmm. You know, so they had to know internally this wasn't uh, two guys and the other two. You know, John George had to have from the from almost from day one it had to be clear there was a talent here. You know, right. And he was really blossoming towards the yeah. end of the Beatles. So what are you going to do with him? You know? Right. And he, See, brought, also, he brought a whole bunch of All Things Must Pass into the Let It Be sessions, you know? Right. I mean, right. They, they ran through, or he ran through, you know, quite a lot. And uh, apparently nobody was that interested. It's 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 kind of a, it's a, it's a sad thing, you know? Um, you know, we've done. We did a show. We did a show once called like "What Were the Beatles' Mistakes?" And you know, I think yep. we talked about Magical Mystery Tour and Magic Alex, whatever else. But you know, this is one we might not have gotten to. Um, the the way that they dealt with George, basically all through, until nearly the the very end. You know, sort of not letting him. Uh, have an equal say, you know? I mean, and, and, well, and the proof of the pudding, in a way, is the fact that Here Comes the Sun is the most streamed song today. Hmm. So. Well, actually, when we talked about that in that show, I had mentioned the way they treated George, especially towards Did the you? end. Oh, okay. Yeah. It wasn't throughout the entire history of the Beatles, but George's songs were always solid. He just wasn't as prolific until right. towards the end. Yeah, And when you think about all the songs they did during the Let It Be sessions that ended up on All Things Must Pass, and instead you got I Me Mine and For You Blue, and I love both those songs, but I don't think they're as strong as most of what's on All Things Must Pass. Mm. That's Good true. point. Good point. Also, and maybe this to, to wrap up the discussion, you know, we are talking 1969, and there isn't a lot of uh, history uh, generally speaking, with pop bands, pop music bands, uh, having this sort of fame and uh, the baggage that comes with the fame and bands breaking up. That was a fairly new concept, you know, in 1969. There were some, Cream broke up, there were other bands that broke up. But what did a breakup mean, you know, in 69? Today, a band breaks up, the jokes immediately start, how long until they reunite? Uh, once they reunite, are they going to go on tour? How many reunion tours will there be? Mm. You know, uh, mm-hmm. would they dare go out there with just one key member? You know, we've got this whole 50 years of history uh, to kind of compare what was going on in 69, when in reality, most of it was uncharted territory. What is a breakup? You know what I mean? In 1969, does that mean we don't record an album for a year? That would be an eternity in those days. Mm-hmm. You know, and then just reconvene in January of 72 or something and do a new Beatle album. It would be like uh, the Beatles spent a century apart. This was a breakup. They stopped for a couple of months to do so or a year or so to do some other things. And they're back. Today, we look at it as breakup being this ultimate declaration of the end. You know what I mean? And it wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and it just so happened that they ended up with four very successful solo careers and there just was not enough time in the day to manage Beatle activities with their sudden now individual fame. And the reunion never happened and the breakup became permanent. And uh, Abbey Road is the last thing they did, even though they probably weren't thinking of, of it like that. Like that. Mm-hmm. Mm. So the question remains, what was the final nail in the coffin or was there one? Could the Beatles have stayed in limbo for quite a while before a final decision was made? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's no way to know. It's interesting, though, that it appears that Lennon's declaration about wanting a divorce seemed to be the one statement that carried all the weight. At least that's what it looks like. Until John says that, there still seems to be hope, some uh, amount of hope for a future. Even after John said it, I mean, George felt that there was hope into 1970. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true. But Paul is talking in absolutes in the, in the Life magazine article. We, mm-hmm. That's how we read it mm-hmm. when, although he might be, like you were saying, might have been referring to the Beatles as you knew them five years ago have been blown up. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah, you know, the fact is that um, they continue to squabble. 
because Paul wanted to be let out of the partnership. You know, if we're if 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 we're not going to play together anymore, we might as well break up the partnership and each take our stuff and go home. And the others were not inclined to let him do that. So he had to sue them in order to break up the partnership. And even when he prevailed in court in 1971, it still took another four years for all of them to sign the bit of paper that said that this partnership is dissolved. And then yet, oddly enough, here they are now. Apple still exists. Apple still exists and they're all, and the widows of the two who are not here are all partners in it. It's kind of, you know, you you kind of just wish that they had, um, you know, settled it more logically at the time. And right. then, you know, okay, fine. We have broken up contractually. You've signed the thing. You've split the partnership. Now let's talk about what the partnership can be if we decide to do it again, <laughs> you know? Because right, they did right. decide to do it again, obviously. You know, Paul is a, a part of Apple, even though, you know, he sued to get out of it. He's in right. it now. So, yeah. But, oh, well, <laughs> you know, I mean, thinking about what it could have been kind of useless. <laughs> so we've talked for about, uh, it's, it, this has ended up being a very fascinating conversation. We've gone on for a show of approximately an hour and a half, give or take. Um, so let's put a wrap here and, uh, go around the table, give our contact info. I mean, I'll start, uh, you can send me emails to my WFUV email address. Uh, that's Darren DeVivo spelled out D A R R E N D E V I V O at WFUV.org or go to Facebook and, uh, like my radio page, which is Darren DeVivo on WFUV radio. That's the page I'd like you to go to. And uh, those are the easiest ways to keep in touch with me, Ken. Yes. <laughs> <How about you? laughs> All right. My email address is at net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. As Darren was talking about at the beginning of the show, there is a page devoted to my show, Every Little Thing, the syndicated show, where you can look up all the radio stations that carry it and their broadcast times with links to their websites, and you can stream the show. So uh, that's all on my website. I also have Weekly Beatles Trivia, where you could win one of nine great Beatle prizes. And I do have uh, Paul McCartney's Amoeba gig as one of the prizes on uh, the trivia page. And that happens every single week. It runs Monday through Sunday. There's always a winner every single week with my trivia. I am giving away a pair of tickets to see the Beatles tribute band, the Fab Four. They're playing a show in Rhode Island in Cranston on November the 16th. It's very easy to win. All you New Englanders listening, Hmm. if you want to see this great Beatles tribute band, it's easy as pie to win on my website for that. And uh, don't forget, I have uh, another Beatles podcast show. It's all on the Solo Beatles called Talk More Talk, a Solo Beatles video cast. And Darren, it is a podcast, too, because it's available not only as a video cast on Facebook and YouTube, but it's also uh, the audio of that has been extracted from the video. And you can listen to it on Podbean, just like here with us and on iTunes and a uh, whole bunch of places. Whole bunch just of platforms. When I- just when I think I've figured all of this out. <laughs> You're as technical as me, Darren. So, <laughs> And over to Alan. Uh, we want to shoot you, send you spam or, uh, you know, love letters. How can we do that? <laughs> Probably the easiest way to get to me is on Facebook, where I have two pages. One is Alan Cozen, and the other is Alan Cozen Remixed. Alan Cozen Remixed has more of the Beatles stuff. The other has more of my sort of standard work um but they cross over now and then also if you have gotten through this show and haven't had enough of me uh as you know i sometimes appear on swinging through the 60s which has now been rebranded as the beatles naked um you know in the sense of you know getting down to the whatever um i'm on the current show which is i think number 30 and um 
I'm talking, uh, you know, with Richard Buskin and Eric Taros, and with me is Adrian Sinclair, my co-author of The McCartney Legacy. There's a little bit of overlap with this show that we just did, but mostly we're talking about um, Paul and what he was going through from the McCartney album through uh, through Ram. We go a little bit further, but the, the subject of the show was that. If you want to reach any of us or all of us, you can send us an email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter feed at things we said fab. And we have a Facebook page. I think we have two Facebook pages. The one I use is things we said today Beatles radio fans, which is where I post the shows. Uh, and also things we said today uh, seems to be related to the show too. It, it may have been back in the days when Steve was uh, was doing all of the web presence for us. I think he may have set that up uh, oh. as well. And it has current discussions on it. So many ways to contact us. All right. Well, this has been very fascinating and I've enjoyed uh, stepping aside for a good chunk of it to uh, be a listener and fan and educate myself, as I said earlier. I'm Darren DeVivo for Alan Cozen for Ken Michaels. Uh, we will see you with the next show. Uh, and we'll be talking Ringo Starr, What's My Name? And uh, we've got some interesting things in the planning stages for shows coming up for the remainder of 2019. So for Alan and Ken, I'm Darren DeVivo. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, on things we said today.